like to welcome you all uh, and to begin our evening with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the lands on which we're hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. These are the ancestral homelands of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee and the Atawenderons or neutrals. And this is home to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. Medify recognizes that the many injustices experienced by the indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well being. Medify respects that indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all of us to reflect on the territories we are calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. With that, uh, I welcome you to this evening's presentation on community-based withdrawal management services. And although Rosie, Linda, and Keith are speaking about the Toronto context, I think that what they have to share will be broadly relevant. Keith is a nurse practitioner working on the mental health and addiction service at Unity Health. Keith has worked for the Mental Health and Addiction Service for the past eight years as a nurse practitioner. He's worked in the Rapid Access Clinic, Emergency Department, Inpatient Consultation Team, Alcohol Use Disorders Clinic, and for the last six months in withdrawal management at Unity Health, providing addictions care and consultation. Keith currently provides addictions coverage for Glendale House Unity Health Women's Site and Unity Health Men's Site. That sounds like a massive portfolio. I can't quite imagine it. Rosie Yoon is an NP who has worked in both community and hospital programs, working to support people with substance use and mental health challenges. She worked in the Toronto Community Withdrawal Management Services before her current role, supporting the Ontario Health Team Implementation as an OHT Impact Fellow. And Linda Picken is the manager for the addiction services at St. Joseph's Health Centre. Linda is passionate about her work and was chair of the AMHO Withdrawal Management Community of Practice for a number of years, as well as supporting work in updating the AMHO Withdrawal Management Standards in 2014 and 2021. So I'm so pleased to welcome them. Uh, as I was saying, as we chatted earlier, I think um, there, there is so much disconnect between sectors of our services, uh, particularly withdrawal management, uh, and as uh, a setting in which NPs have such a critical and vital role. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you everyone uh, for hosting us. On behalf of Linda and Keith, we're very happy to be here tonight to share with you uh, the community-based withdrawal management services sector uh, considerations from a Toronto context. And so we'll begin. Um, just an uh, overview of our objectives tonight. Uh, what we're hoping to do is to be able to provide at that very high level to describe the clinical and administrative context of the non-medical community-based withdrawal management services uh, from a Toronto context. And second is to identify the scope of services and some of the challenges associated with caring for folks in a, in a non-medical community-based withdrawal management setting. And then we'll end the evening by exploring opportunities for improving care transitions and supporting folks uh, through the withdrawal management services across the healthcare system. Uh, to start the night off, we want to ask folks, true or false, community-based withdrawal management services require that all persons to be medically cleared at the eMERGE prior to being admitted. Please enter your, your votes now. So results are in. Let's see how folks have voted. So 55% uh, uh, is, is responded false. So that, that is mostly correct. Yes, that is true. We do not require everyone to be medically cleared in the merge. However, our addiction counselors and through the intake process have a high level of screening. So anyone who is flagged to be at risk of more complicated medical complication is advised to go to the eMERGE or we send them to eMERGE before coming to community-based withdrawal management. At this point, I'm going to pass the baton over to Linda, who's going to talk about that administrative perspective. Thanks, Rosie, um, and good evening, everyone. 
So um, community withdrawal management plays an important role um, in the system and is often um, the first point of entry or contact um, for individuals um, you know, with um, substance use challenges, issues, um, and you know, a way to get them connected to other parts of the system. Historically, withdrawal management has been a sort of low barrier service. Um, you know, there is a saying, if you can walk and talk, um, then you can get into <laughs> community-based withdrawal management. So, um, but obviously over the last few years, we've had, um, you know, an, an increase in complexity. The substances have changed. Um, you know, we're seeing people with um, more sort of co-occurring mental health issues and medical concerns. And balancing, um, you know, being a low barrier service with making sure that people are safe in our care, um, you know, has been a challenge and continues to be a challenge. I, I do want to also say, though, that, um, you know, the addiction service workers who work at Glendale House, and I'm talking specifically about them, um, you know, are a wonderful group of um, staff um, who provide really great um, supportive care to people. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not medically trained. And so often, um, you know, things are missed. And, um, you know, the lens that they are providing care through is, is not a medical one. And so that does um, produce some challenges. So withdrawal management has been around for about 50 years. Um, it was developed in response to public intoxication. Um, in 1965, the Addiction Research Foundation in Toronto uh, was commissioned to undertake research into this. A pilot project was set up, which included a detoxification centre, a halfway house, and a long-term treatment programme. So in 1970, the government established a committee to further develop policies and programs for dealing with, um, and I'm just going to quote, CDOs, which were chronic drunkenness offenders. Um, they wanted to, you know, sort of make sure that um, there was other services included. And so, um, you know, social and family services, the um, correction system. And one of the goals was for the police to be able to drop intoxicated individuals off at detox. However, um, under the Liquor Licensing Act, the police were unable to drop people off at detoxes because they actually were only um, allowed to take people to either hospitals or um, um, take them into custody. And so in 1971, there was an amendment to the act which required uh, these detox centers um, to be sponsored by a public hospital. So this was the start of um, hospital sponsored community detoxes. And I think it's you know, quite fitting that it, it was thanks to the Liquor Licensing Act rather than any you know, sort of healthcare legislation. So at that time, there you know, were sort of expectations laid out um, for sponsoring hospitals, but there was really very little oversight um, into that. And so it ended up, you know, there was varying degrees of support from sponsoring hospitals. Um, you know, some detoxes were many, many miles away from their sponsoring hospital. And so it looked quite different um, across the province. Our funding does flow through the hospitals, um, but it is slightly different from hospital funding. And so um, basically we get a lump sum and, and um, it, you know, with little sort of increase, um, we haven't, we've had many years where there's been no increases. And so, you know, we are underfunded and have really um, been challenged to kind of keep up with um, the changes that are happening based on um, our, our current funding. 
in the Toronto context in 2014, um, a um, proposal was submitted for funding um, for a nurse practitioner. And so um, we were provided one NP for um, the whole of the system, which at that point was five sites. Poor Keith um, is still kind of <laughs> balancing um, a number of sites. Um, but it meant at the time that we had access to our nurse practitioner one day a week. And then there was the ability to do some virtual care. In 2017, we submitted a further proposal um, for 24-7 nursing support. However, um, it, it was denied. We didn't get the full funding. And it ended up allowing us to have one RN um, for each site, which did um, allow us to sort of better address some of the medical risks um, in, you know, withdrawal, um, comorbidity, med education, complexity, but it also limited us because when you only have a nurse for a limited period of time, you can't make changes to your processes. Um, and so that continued to be a challenge. Currently in Toronto, we have five, five sites. Um, so um, Ossington uh, Withdrawal Management, which is under, um, well, still under um, UHN and then Unity Health. Um, we have a men's program, a women's program, and then there's two co gendered. Um, so, St. Joe's, where I work, uh, we provide supports to both men and women. Um, clients access our service through a centralized intake. And so they are screened um, by, um, you know, um, clinicians who um, understand addiction and can um, sort of provide any red flags or if, if people need to go um, for medical clearance. Although that in itself is a challenge because somebody can be deemed medically cleared at um, a moment in time, but quickly decompensate. Um, we also take referrals from our ER. Um, as well as um, other areas in the hospital. And then, of course, from um, our community partners, um, including our RAM clinics um, and, you know, some of the, the treatment programs. So we are lucky. Um, Glendale House um, was purpose-built. Um, some pictures here. Um, we opened in 2005. Um, and... Um, I'm biased, but I will say that it's probably the nicest <laughs> um, site in Toronto. Um, we are lucky to be um, situated right on hospital property. Um, so we have, you know, our emergency department is fairly close by. Now, that being said, if we have a medical emergency, we still have to call 911 and wait for them to respond. So, um, you know, that, that also sort of presents a, a challenge. I guess, um, you know, being on hospital property is also challenging um, because I think there's some assumptions and expectations that are made. Um, you know, because we're in such close proximity to the, ho to the hospital, um, you know, people maybe think that we operate um, the same way as a hospital does. And so often we find, um, you know, people who are being sent to us, even from our own hospital, um, who are, are still quite medically compromised. And, you know, we, we'll hear comments like, oh, but you guys have nursing. Um, but, you know, there's there's a sort of misconception um, that, that, you know, we have nursing 24-7 and that we have the resources to, to back up, um, you know, treatments. So that that can be a challenge as well. And, you know, when we, when we first introduced nursing, we had to be careful as to how we did that. Um, because yes, we've got nursing, but it doesn't mean that, um, and I think Keith will give you an example later on that, you know, we have oxygen and, and you know, we have pharmacy and we have the ability to, to do labs and that type of thing. So 
St. Joe's is also lucky um, in that, you know, we have a fairly robust um, addiction service. Um, we actually, Dr. Kahan um, was our service head for many years prior to going to women's college. And so we were the first hospital to have a RAM model and an inpatient consult service. Um, our residential um, program, our residential withdrawal management has 26 beds, um, 10 which are crisis beds, and then 16 which we classify as, as program beds. And um, we provide um, you know, groups and individual sort of support, motivational interviewing. And, you know, our hope is that we are able to engage um, people and um, link them to community resources. We also have a fairly strong uh, community program, which um, includes case management. We have a, a day program, um, which currently is, is operating virtually. But, um, you know, when we're in person, we provide a acupuncture, groups, um, assessments and referrals. Um, and then we also have a number of closed groups. Um, so we do mindfulness-based relapse prevention. Again, uh, we were one of the first hospital-based programs to introduce that. Uh, we have a seeking safety group, a relapse prevention group. And most recently, um, we uh, were able to um, have some of our clinicians trained and uh, we now offer a DBT group as well. The original staffing model was non-medical. Um, and of course, the sponsoring hospital was there to provide medical support. But I'm happy to say that over the last few years, we've um, you know, continue to try and build our team and include other disciplines. Um, obviously have Keith, who is um, a great addition, and Rosie actually um, was there before. And I think um, we have one participant, uh, Mike, who's uh, joining us today. And um, he also um, was the nurse practitioner um, for the withdrawal management system at one point. Um, we've also recently, um, and I guess as a result of um, the um, Metify and, and RAM, we've introduced peer support into our program and we've had some really good feedback. Um, so currently our peer support worker does some work in withdrawal management as well as um, the inpatient mental health unit. Um, and as I say, we're getting some uh, good feedback um, about his role and um, his ability to engage with people who may, you know, not be quite ready to to sort of come to withdrawal management or, or may not, that may not be sort of on their horizon at the moment. I'm just going to finish. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic and, um, you know, that has created some additional challenges um, on top of the challenges that we've already um, experiencing. We normally have capacity for 26 clients um, and actually at the beginning of the pandemic uh, we closed our unit um, and I guess that's one of the other challenges of being on hospital property was that the built Glendale house was repurposed for other um, purposes um, during the the beginning beginning of the pandemic when we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. In July of 2021, we opened up again, um, but since then um, we've operated at a reduced capacity, um, unfortunately. Um, so we're really only operating at about 50%. Um, we're hoping um, to um, you know, start to build that back up so that we can get back up to full capacity um, as quickly as possible. The other issue, of course, was that um, lots of our outpatient care was transitioned to virtual. Um, and although we are getting some really good feedback and, and people are liking um, the flexibility of virtual care, we also recognize that there's um, large communities and um, people that um, do not have access um, because they don't have phones or, or computers or Wi-Fi or, um, you know, a private space 
um, to participate in, in groups or counselling. And then, of course, because, you know, we um, reduced our capacity, many other services across the province reduced their capacity too. Um, some of the, the treatment programmes closed. Um, and so this has resulted in um, longer wait lists. And, um, you know, we we really like to, we strive, um, you know, to, to link people to the most appropriate service. We want people to leave our service and, and you know, be supported when they leave. Um, however, um, you know, because of the pandemic, we're finding that harder and harder. And, um, you know, often we are discharging people, unfortunately, back to where they came from. And um, it's not necessarily the safest of spaces. I will now pass it on to Keith um, to outline um, some of the challenging situations um, that not necessarily Glendale House, but um, that, that uh, as a nurse practitioner, he's faced. Yeah, I'm realizing it's helpful if you turn your microphone off before you try to speak into it. But uh, nonetheless, I just wanted to provide a bit of context as to uh, my role and uh, where I've come from and uh, where I'm headed kind of thing. Uh, I've been working as a nurse practitioner in the detox uh, setting for about the past six months. Um, Rosie and Linda are truly my mentors in the context of a community setting. So I want to thank you both for kind of molding me uh, into the system. But I also want to thank you for scaring the hell out of me uh, in my first month there. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so I work eight to four. I, I'm currently covering three detox sites and I run a alcohol use disorders clinic two full days a week and coming come of April 1st, I'm going to have a fourth detox site uh, when Unity Health assumes um, Ossington, which is currently under the University Health Network. Uh, so I came from the comfort of a hospital setting where I had full access to resources, labs, diagnostics, other uh, professionals in here. I could refer patients that had complex medical issues to uh, internal medicine. If I, there was a code, I had a code team and I just had to provide a, about five, uh, less than five minutes of kind of CPR and stuff. And then I was asked to step aside, which was very lovely. Uh, so in working uh, in a direct specialization as well in addictions, I kind of had to learn uh, how to become a jack of all trades again, uh, family medicine aspects of things, women's health aspects of things, mental health, in addition to uh, my addiction. So there was a huge learning curve when I was coming into this here. And uh, my, I think my first real encounter with the detox and that, and, and people were worried whether I would actually stay there after this, is a code that happened um, kind of a pre-code well that guy was kind of blue in that so I would say that was of concern and my first thing was uh, I yelled to Linda can you grab me the oxygen and Linda said Keith we don't have oxygen this is a detox and then all the things that you could think of that you might want to rhyme off that you're looking for during a code situation I was met with the answers of no 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 and uh, Linda came out and checked in with me and I guess she was worried um, you know because Rosie was leaving and that that I might uh, follow Rosie after a month of being in there but we, we had a nice little check-in and debrief and I was actually really pleased with the way the counselors supported us and Linda and how calm she was with with, uh, giving the report to 911 and talking about the clinical situation. So with all that in mind and the nice little debrief, I, I decided to stay on and here I am six months later. Uh, so I want to talk to you about a, a case study um, that uh, that happened in one of the detoxes. And, and apolo I apologize up front if, for, for my spelling errors in here. Uh, Grammar is not my forte. Uh, but I want to review a case study with you here. So JL is a 40-year-old lady with a history of an alcohol use disorder. She typically drinks 20 ounces of vodka daily. She has a history of seizures. Uh, she, her last drink was approximately nine days ago. She was volume loaded in the emergency department sent with a script and uh, she's no longer in uh, alcohol withdrawal, hemodynamically stable. There's no other substance use. So from a withdrawal perspective, she's kind of uh, withdrawn already. Um, here's where the challenges come in. She's got a complex mental health history. She's got a history of borderline personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder, anxiety, depression, PTSD, trauma, chronic self-harm, and asthma. Uh, so she's 
tried to cut herself on three different days and three different occasions since she's been at the detox. Uh, the wounds are described as superficial and they're bandaged. Uh, the night before uh, I came on, she was out because uh, I come in on Wednesdays, she was uh, went out for a cigarette and uh, she didn't return for an hour. And she said that she was going to go to the drugstore to buy medication to overdose. So the staff are completely overwhelmed with her psychopathology. And she's got, um, so she's been using the splitting and projective identification as her defense mechanisms. I come on site today and uh, she has, I think, about 16 different altars, and some of them are stronger than other altars, and some are telling her to kill herself. Uh, others are telling her that she's, she shouldn't do this, and they keep oscillating back and forth. So we there's no comprehensive treatment plan in place. We get admin on the phone. We sit there with the, the, the counselors and myself, and we try to come up with a treatment plan. And because her um, suicidality is seen as chronic, uh, then the, the plan is if she does this again, that she should be discharged. But here's the challenge. Uh, it's minus 10 outside. She's got no proper attire to be discharged. We get a, a nice phone call from her community caseworker who threatens to take legal action against us if we discharge this uh, individual uh, without proper attire. Um, it becomes so... Uh, the, the pathology becomes so intense that it consumes uh, all four of our efforts for the entire day. And we're all exhausted in that. And we end up um, kind of talking with her and she agrees that she should probably go for a mental health assessment at CAMH. Uh, uh, we're, we have the mobile crisis team come and um, we're, we're questioned as to why we're sending her off and that we clearly articulate that the withdrawal uh, is, is over. There's no medical issues, but the majority of her stuff, uh, of her presentation is, uh, is, is, is complex uh, mental health uh, uh, challenges that we're having. So I want to ask uh, this poll question as a true or false. Detoxes in Toronto have 24-hour nursing care and are equipped to manage complex medical and mental health issues. Um, so I this is the poll question here, and I'll wait for your responses. Okay, so uh, it, it's false that we don't have 24-hour uh, nursing care, as Linda had mentioned. We're not, you know, we're, we're really good at managing a lot of the addiction stuff and some trauma stuff. We're trauma-informed, um, but we, we don't have the supports in place to manage complex medical and mental health uh, challenges with, with clients that come in. We're looking to put in more supports in that, but as of this time, we don't have the ability to do that. And here's a poll question uh, number two for this uh, case uh, study A. Human services counselors have advanced training to manage complex medical and mental health issues, true or false? Uh, again, it's false that, uh, you, you know, the human service counselors that uh, we have at our detoxes do a really great job at identifying complex medical conditions. And, and uh, for non-medical staff, they do an ex exceptionally great job, but uh, they don't have advanced training to manage complex medical and mental health issues. Although, again, they do a, a fabulous job. Um, so I just wanted to do a little bit of debrief on, on this case study here. Um, so I think that the challenging thing with this case study here was that uh, this, this patient had very severe psychopathology. I think uh, it, it's hard enough trying to manage um, people with uh, chronic suicidal ideation and borderline personality disorder. But I think the really challenging thing here was the dissociative identity disorder and, uh, you know, the multiple alters and things. So I figure um, from my past experience, when I worked on a mental health unit, you would have a mental health nurse that was highly skilled and trained, access to a psychiatrist, administration staff, and uh, allied health, and a lot of different supports to manage the complexity of illness uh, that this client was experiencing. And that, so we had no access to psychiatrists. What happens if we had to form this patient if they were acutely suicidal uh, on top of the chronicity of their suicidal ideations? We don't have op constant observation, although we had to keep her in the observation area. Uh, uh, the, the, the counselor still had to go around, prepare meals and do other things uh, within the detox. Uh, there's no mental health nurse. There's no secu seclusion area. There's no access to PRN medications or other uh, mental uh, med medical services. Um, again, the issues here are primarily mental health. They're not medical related and they're not uh, withdrawal related. 
And I think it, it's hard enough in the context of not having all the alters in that to distinguish uh, what's acute versus chronic suicidal ideation. And even people that are trying to sort through chronic versus acute struggle with decisions and often have to kind of huddle together and uh, really look at the, uh, ex the the circumstances of the client and, and, and changes in pattern. Uh, so I, another challenge was this is a new facility, was taken over uh, recently by, by Unity Health and probably the last four months you have a, a number of new staff on there that are, that are working. Uh, there's no administration staff on site. Uh, there's no other medical staff on site with the exception of myself being there on Wednesday from eight to four, primarily run uh, by counselors. Another challenge too that we were experiencing at the detox is with COVID and uh, staffing issues and stuff. So there was times where we even had to close down the, the detox. Um, the hospital uh, is, is about four to five kilometers away from where this site is located. So geographically, that was a huge challenge as well. Uh, and and uh, I, I think another huge challenge was that uh, this one client consumed so much of our resources that there was four of us on that day. And it took all four of us, all of our efforts to try and manage this client. And the other clients in there didn't get the optimal treatment and care that they that they needed and stuff and sometimes even the uh, you know there's a lot of trauma within the context of the detox so other clients witnessing her slashing and doing other things might trigger them or traumatic events and things so it was really trying to look at not only the best interest of this client here but the best interest of all of the clients all overall um, so I think this was a, a really uh, big challenge and hopefully in the uh, in the end when we open it up to discussion we can talk about about some of these concerns that, uh, that, that, that happened in this situation. But this was, uh, we did a debrief after this here and all four of us were, were, we were totally exhausted and consumed by everything that happened here. And um, you know, what more for, for us to try and manage this in a, in a community setting when it's really uh, hard to manage even in the context of having all the supports in an acute care setting. Uh, so I wanna review another case study with you here that uh, uh, I, I had a little short time ago. So I was, uh, this is, don't forget, this is, I'm called over a telephone and I'm trying to manage this situation here. So JR is a 60 year old lady who pre presented to the detox 24 hours ago. She has a history of daily crack use, approximately 40 to $60 worth per day. Uh, she doesn't use any other substances. She has a past history of hypertension and depression. She has intermittent chest discomfort. So I'm called uh, from the detox for medication re reconciliation. And because this client was symptomatic, she has chest pain. She has a headache. She has dizziness. She has some respiratory related symptoms. Um, her client had her PCR test. The last one was about three months ago. There's no recent PCR test. She was vaccinated times one. Client uh, brought a, a bunch of medications into the detox. They were ordered uh, probably three to four months ago, but she still has some of these medications left and she's been taking these medications. And I'm called by the, um, the counselors and they're asking me which ones they should order, which ones they shouldn't. And there's a question whether the amulodipine was uh, replaced with the ulnasartan or, or vice versa. So I'm trying to navigate this uh, all, all by phone and that. So there's nothing virtual in terms of being able to see the client or have a conversation with them virtually. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, which one should she be able to take and which ones uh, shouldn't she be able to take? Uh, so the uh, a, a poll question that I'll get you to type a response in the chat box is, would you feel comfortable managing JR's care remotely as a clinician? Yes or no? So I do see a lot of no's here, and I, uh, I, that moves us along to question B here. What are your concerns in relation to JR? And I'd just like you to type in the chat box concerns that, uh, that you have in relation to managing this client remotely. I see needs a full uh, cardiovascular assessment, uh, lack of her vital signs. Those were concerns I had. Yeah, you don't know what the, the, the BP is. Only only the uh, a nurse could check the blood, blood pressure. Counselors can't do that. Uh, yeah, so all, all of the things, it's, it's just really hard in terms of the assessment. This is what I'm seeing here, not having the information, the clinical information you need. Yeah, the, the counselors really take on a lot of responsibility uh, working in the context of a, of a detox setting. They're, they're 
really good at identifying emergent situations and uh, and calling nine one one and if if, uh, if if situations are critical. She does need a, a higher level of care um, for sure, at least an assessment to make sure diagnostically that there's nothing serious going on. Maybe an EKG, CT to the head to see if there's anything. And, and I agree, COVID has made us work out our, outside our comfort zone. And I'm going to talk about some of the challenges with COVID and, uh, and trying to work diagnostically with patients. Okay, let's move on to uh, part C of the, of the question here then. How has COVID-19 changed the way we deliver care in the context of detox settings? I see that, that you know, we've had to be more forgiving and, and that's true. We've, uh, you know, had to kind of understand that we're in the midst of a pandemic and uh, reduce capacity and, and, and kind of work around the parameters. Yeah, bed, bed closures have reduced capacity really uh, in, in hospital settings and in community settings. I think one of the challenges is working in uh, a community setting versus a hospital is most patients are screened for COVID coming into a hospital uh, and, and before their uh, disposition to a room or, or another part of the hospital. But in the detox setting, you don't have that kind of diagnostic, which is, which is a challenge. So I think the risk for outbreaks in a detox setting, uh, you know, could potentially be higher than uh, risk for outbreaks in a hospital setting where you have infection control. We don't have a rapid antigen test, uh, unfortunately, in the detox setting, and we had to send clients out to have PCR tests. Yet the outbreaks aren't fun, and we've experienced one at Glendale House where many of the staff were sick and off, and uh, we had to close down, and that reduced even further capacity within the context of the detox setting. Uh, if for people that do have the rapid antigen tests, I think that's a, that's a bonus in that, and uh, PCR on, on site. If that is that a detox setting that uh, you have on site, or is it another setting, a detox? I think that's amazing. If you have a where 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 are you? Uh, uh, Type of, or Sudbury. I think that's very innovative and stuff. And I, I, I wish we had access to that. But that's one of our challenges as well, that we don't have access to that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it, uh, in, in, at least in Toronto and the detox settings that I work in, um, that's been one of the challenges. And I'm going to talk about it uh, in the next slide, which is our discussion, one of the challenges that I face with this here, because it really puts you behind the eight ball when you're doing an assessment uh, with a client. Um, are we okay to move uh, to the discussion slide? Okay, I'll move forward to the discussion slide then. So I, I think, like for me, as mentioned in the chat box, it's very, very difficult to uh, to assess somebody remotely, especially if you, you don't have uh, telemedicine. Um, so you're really relying on the counselor's assessment uh, to give you the accurate information. But again, they can't do blood pressure and there's limits to what they can do. They don't have access to Connecting Ontario or the records that we have, although they, I really find the counselors do a fabulous job for non-medical staff and uh, they're very, very knowledgeable, but there's limits to things that they can do with uh, their ability and scope of practice and that. So that is a challenge. Um, so even with a nurse on site, sometimes uh, you, you, you still aren't able to assess the patient uh, to the full ability that you need to as a nurse practitioner. Uh, so when I get, the, I rely on that, but I also go to Connecting Ontario to get uh, some of the information. Um, I, 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 I've found it really challenging because I was at another site and, and this time I was seven kilometers away from this site where, uh, where this, this patient was, or this client was. Uh, so I think, um, one of the things that I faced in the detox here, because we don't have the rapid antigen tests and PCR tests, is you get a client that comes in, there might be an opiate withdrawal, but because they have symptoms respiratory-wise, you're forced to send them over uh, to, to be cleared from an infection control standpoint and stuff. So, you know, you've got somebody that's in uh, withdrawal, you're trying to help them through the withdrawal, but you also have to send them over. Now they feel crappy and they're sitting in an emergency department for, uh, you know, three or four hours and that. So they're, they're very upset about that. Um, so I was thinking, does she have, is she having an MI maybe from the, the crack cocaine use? Uh, is she at risk for a stroke? Uh, you know, the, the medications I'm trying to get a hold of, a, you know, if even trying to get a hold of the family doctor, it can take uh, days to, to, to get a hold of a family doctor, especially in the midst of the, the pandemic. I, I don't feel comfortable 
ordering any of these medications because I don't know how she's been taking them and that. So I really need to consult with the, uh, the family uh, physician in order to uh, figure out you know, what she's been taking. I'm thinking are some of these symptoms maybe caused because she's been doubling up on uh, car- her cardiac meds. I'm thinking, is she in withdrawal from maybe the escitalopram? Uh, and, and I've got no access to any kind of diagnostics. I can't order a cardiogram. I can't order any lab work. Um, and then I, the challenge is too, that the client doesn't want to go to the emergency department, even though they're highly symptomatic. So you're on the phone working with the counselors, trying to convince somebody to go to the emergency department. You've got no kind of relationship with them and they just hear that there's some guy's voice on the other end of the phone telling them to go to the emergency department. Um, uh, So uh, eventually this client did go to the emergency department with persuasion and that, but this just goes to show you uh, some of the challenges that we face trying to work remote, trying to manage a number of sites, trying to be there uh, for a limited amount of time and try to provide the best possible care that we we can as as a team uh, um, in the context of the detox setting. And if you have any thoughts on this, you can can hold that to the discussion part at the end. Um, I'd like to hear some of your input on on, on these scenarios here, but I'm going to pass it over to Rosie and she's going to go over uh, case uh, C. Yes. So um, I'll just read the case. So you are the nurse practitioner and you work across five withdrawal management sites. And today you are on site at location X where staff have flagged a client needing your assessment. According to their report, the client arrived over the weekend, which is four days ago, via central access for support for opiate withdrawal. Their their main substance is fentanyl. But the, the staff Uh, sent them to emerge upon arrival because of opiate withdrawal symptoms that were escalating. So while the person was in eMERGE, they were restarted on methadone, which was a very starting dose. And because the eMERGE found out through Connecting Ontario that they were on and off 20 milligrams of methadone for five days prior. Um, so they gave them 20 milligrams, gave a script to uh, for daily dispensing at the community pharmacy, which uh, our withdrawal management clients, they walk over to the pharmacy and get their dose and walk back. And, um, but, uh, and a follow-up appointment at the RAM. So what's happening now is um, they missed their appointment at the RAM yesterday because they weren't feeling well. And... Um, However, he has gone to the pharmacy over the last three days, and he has received 20 milligrams daily for the last three days, no misdosis, Um, and he's not sleeping. So staff are reporting he's up all night, he looks really, really sick, um, not eating, and, um, you know, you go in and and he does appear unwell, he's complaining that he hasn't slept, he's tachycardic, he's tremulous. His gait is unsteady. Um, There's no muscle aches. There's no chills. There's no GI symptoms. He denies any alcohol use and says he doesn't really use alcohol. And uh, but he he's oriented fully, but he does appear anxious, agitated, and physically unwell. What is the most likely differential diagnosis going on? So I'll let you plug that in. Okay. So nobody thinks it's unmanaged with, with alcohol withdrawal in this situation. Uh, It was it was um, mostly unmanaged benzo withdrawal uh, because uh, what became uh, kind of slid under the radar was a Xanax daily Xanax use with the fentanyl uh, because in the their their drug of choice was fentanyl and they didn't feel that the Xanax was a a primary substance of concern Uh, it was underreported and hence it went under the radar. Um, and so he was having a mixed presentation, definitely opiate withdrawal because the 20 milligrams of methadone is not going to do a tinkle in his uh, withdrawal management. But we had this raging Xanax withdrawal underneath. So uh, we did send him back to eMERGE. And thankfully, it's literally uh, uh, we roll the wheelchair across the road into the eMERGE. So it wasn't uh, seven kilometers away. It was fantastic. We walked him over. He ended up needing to go to ICU. Because if, if, at that point, you know, four days in, it was completely unmanaged. So, and he, he, he had a rough go of it. And so um, that was the case. So in terms of what Linda has kind of started the night off with is 
really things go awry quickly when they go awry. Uh, it's very unpredictable in that way. You know, people walk in and then suddenly things really change quickly. Um, and having to manage that in a community-based kind of setting is very challenging. Okay. And yes, yeah, Xanax, like trying to do the conversion, benzo conversion on like unknown amount of bars uh, is, uh, is very hard. And, and there was a question on the chat, do we have any stock meds? Some, some locations do where they have nursing support. Some can't. And at, even at minimum, there is variation in the availability of stock meds, basic things like gravel. Gravel, Tylenol, Imodium, uh, you know, Advil, uh, j just basic things. You know, there are some locations we, we don't have that. So we're, people are going through withdrawal and we can't offer them basic over-the-counter, which are, are very practical challenges. So I'm going to go to our, our next section and our last leg of our journey together today, which is from the Toronto context to the wider context, I think we can have a lots of similarities, even with withdrawal managements in like rural Ontario and or or otherwise. Um, in some cases, you know, many parts of Ontario are in terms of withdrawal management kind of supports are ahead of the Toronto context. So, um, so let's uh, bring that focus to kind of the system context. And some of the high level themes in community-based withdrawal management services is that it does play a really vital role in supporting people who are needing and wanting a safe place in their withdrawal management experience, regardless of what their treatment goals are. Uh, you know, people need, there's a need for community-based withdrawal management uh, so that, you know, for whatever reason, they can't withdraw at home or alone. So there's a vital kind of pitiful role that community-based withdrawal management serves. The second theme is, a lot of residential treatment programs require uh, withdrawal management prior to treatment entry. And, and withdrawal management serves that uh, kind of key functional piece in the system. Having said that, community-based withdrawal management provides opportunity to connect with brief intervention, counseling support, and referral to treatment and services. Uh, so it is a gateway often. And, and the withdrawal management addiction service workers and counselors do amazing work with people. They're the ones doing the brief intervention, motivational interviewing, uh, groups, and the relationship and trust that people form in this uh, very vulnerable time is such an important intervention. But there are challenges, as you would have picked up from our talk tonight. Uh, and fundamentally, due to historical funding envelope structures, the community-based withdrawal management services, essentially in Toronto, uh, there's a funding disparity. So the, it makes a huge barrier and challenge in terms of health, human uh, resources, staffing. We, it, there's a brain drain. So we hire lovely counselors, you know, straight from university and college, and we cannot retain them. They move on. Um, and uh, same with nurses. It's really hard to recruit nurses into uh, withdrawal management settings. Uh, second is, withdrawal management services are situated in a wider system, as you know, that has gaps. Uh, and the gaps for me, I think, are at the system level, uh, appropriate access to medical withdrawal management. That is a gap. And, and the second is a uh, gap in transition services. So transition services mean, you know, once people finish their withdrawal management uh, component, you know, you don't suddenly leap to a residential treatment program. There, there is a need for transition support beds, and the system doesn't have that. And, and why this is important is those gaps are now playing out at the community withdrawal management uh, sector, right, where we, we can't discharge people after they withdraw because there's nowhere for them to go for the 60 days that they have to go to treatment. There's no transition beds. And so we... we we extend our stays, and we, but we know we're, that's not where the solution is. I'm going to go back to medical withdrawal management. People need medical withdrawal management. And I, I say this because putting nurses and nurse practitioners into community based withdrawal management doesn't turn it into a medical withdrawal management. But what, to be honest with you, the severity, the complexity of the medical needs of clients that we're seeing 
is so high. We're not talking run of the mill kind of you know moderate to mild alcohol withdrawal. We're we're looking at very severe complex cases, especially with opiate and mixed presentations. And um, that summarizes the challenges, which are system level challenges uh, that we really need to advocate and and highlight. And it brings us to opportunities. So what are some of the opportunities is, you know, um, withdrawal management is like a key piece of the puzzle in the recovery and, and treatment services sector. But the pathways in and out and between withdrawal management and the rest of the addiction services, including, uh, you know, medical, RAM, community-based, those connections are, are not so strong. Uh, we, we, community withdrawal management uh, somehow operates in an island. And so going forward, the opportunities, even with uh, family practices or solo practitioners, you know, strengthening those uh, transition linkages is a key opportunity. Second opportunity is I really think it's a time to reevaluate and reimagine the scope of community-based withdrawal management services to align with the changing needs of people who use substances now in our current context. You know, the, the community-based withdrawal management services hasn't really changed in terms of funding or support in 30 years, but the needs have changed. So we need to really critically look at this so that we are prepared and structured to support um, the community. And the key word in community-based withdrawal management is community. Um, you know, I think I, I think about Glendale House and uh, Glendale House is really part of the community in terms of its service presence and network and, and um, reputation. You know, the team really makes connections with uh, other treatment programs and RAMs. And you can already tell that, you know, that community based approach also helps their clients connect to the community resources. So that brings us to our end and opening up for the larger discussion. Well, thank you all so much. Um, to all of our attendees, please feel, feel free to add your, your questions to um, the chat. I see a couple that I'll pose, but um, as those are coming in, uh, well, thank you. Um, I'm struck by the complexity of the clients that you're dealing with, with such limited resources. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, the challenges around gaps in the system. I wanna mention something that I, I did earlier, which is the withdrawal um, management um, setting manual uh, that has been spearheaded by Katie Denham. Um, and probably many people on this call uh, contributed as authors and reviewers to writing this manual for WMS. So um, I, I think it speaks to a lot of the, the gaps in training. And I know that it identifies some of the criteria for assessing clients coming in in terms of appropriateness. It offers some forms and strategies for communicating with um, the ED and back and forth. I think it's it was illuminating for me uh, to understand some of what, what goes on and what isn't available in the withdrawal management setting. So I want to make sure people are aware of that and thank everyone who contributed to it. Um, but I guess one of the things that I want to ask you is, um, you know, could you describe sort of a successful, I mean, all of these were successful in that people got the care that they needed. Your teams came together, you transferred patients to the emergency department as appropriate, you know, you, you held people and you used the resources that you had. Um, but could you maybe, for those of us who um, know are, are thinking about sending patients with withdrawal um, from alcohol, uh, or I've had patients who you know, are potentially relatively stable in terms of their opioid use disorder management, but trying to manage, you know, cocaine or crack use, for example, and, and trying to sort of get into a withdrawal management setting for the support to make changes. And again, I know how much has changed in the last few years due to COVID, but paint a little bit of a picture about what we can do. What do patients need to come with in terms of expectations, prescriptions? How, how can we set people up for success? One of the things in terms of medications, prescriptions, is it's really helpful um, for somebody to come with a prescription for any medications that they need. 
Um, and, you know, the other challenge in terms of medications is that um, we, we have limited ability to do PRNs. So, okay. you know, if somebody's coming in for alcohol withdrawal and, and we get a prescription that says, you know, um, for diazepam, you know, as needed, um, you know, that's difficult for the, you know, as counsellors, they can't determine when it's needed um, because they're not, you know, we're, we're doing a withdrawal management checklist, but it's not the CWA. And of course, we don't have protocols um, in place um, to do that. So, you know, if there's if there's a way in which, um, you know, people can come with prescriptions or the medications in bottles and blister packs and, you know, properly labeled with, you know, those directions on them. I think, you know, I, I, I guess the other piece is that, um, you know, we, we do try to be um, flexible, but our length of stay really is seven to 10 days. Um, at least that's what we do at Glendale House. Some others are shorter than that. Um, and and so, you know, sometimes we're sort of setting people up if if they think that they can come into withdrawal management and that they're going to go directly into treatment. Mm. And unfortunately, that's not the case. And so it, it's sort of thinking about, you know, um, even as they're coming into withdrawal management, what's their plan <laughs> um, for leaving withdrawal management and you know what are what other um resources do they have um do they have support you know other supports um so that you know that can be challenging um you know from from that perspective of of um managing those expectations that that people think that they're going to withdraw and then walk straight into treatment and and for the most part, um, just kind of building off your question, people have positive experiences. Um, one of the things about community withdrawal management is it's really open door where you're at. So we have folks um, who come in multiple times, and that's okay, uh, and and develop relationships with the counselors. Um, a lot of the withdrawal management programs run day programs, so after you finish withdrawal management, you're welcome to continue on in their day programs, which some of them are offered virtually. The, the, I guess the most important thing is to, as long as there's no high risk, like if this person is not at high risk for complicated withdrawal, most people can be safely supported in a community-based withdrawal management. Um, what people find most helpful is not being alone in their withdrawal having someone check in on them. The counselors are very uh, warm. They do one-on-one, -on -one, uh, especially for folks who have a lot of anxiety and there's a trigger for them to relapse. Some, for a lot of folks, withdrawal itself is a trigger to relapse. And being in a, a structured, uh, warm, welcoming environment during that experience kind of builds confidence. And people leave saying, you know what? I had no idea that I could do this. People are scared. Like people will stop with their bags in front of the door and you can see them and they'll just stand there. You can, you see them process, like trying to fight, turning back and running away and they make it and they, they say, I, I didn't think I was going to stay and mm -hmm. they stay. And, and the level of confidence that people have is amazing. Um, and we hope that when they connect with their RAM doctors or their uh, counselors, that that momentum is connected. And what's nice, the opportunity is it would be nice to like strengthen those pathways and, and work together. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions in the chat is um, what proportion of clients are under 18? So I guess, you know, in that 16 to 18 kind of window and how prepared staff are for working with adolescents uh, and tied with that, I guess, how, you know, the younger patient population feels um, about being in the same setting and groups, et cetera, with adults who may be much older. That can be pretty challenging, right? You know, it's very seldom that we get people in uh, in the system that uh, are, are of teenage years and stuff. And, and when we do, um, I always find it challenging 
to kind of resource uh, clients that are younger and that just we've got more experience trying to resource, uh, you know, people of, of, of in their in their 30s and uh, 40s and 50s and that and people in their teenage years are, are far and few between. I think I heard from one of our, our counselors working at one of the detoxes that we had uh, someone that was 16 come in and they didn't stay too long in the in the detox setting because often they feel uncomfortable with uh, older people around them. I, can, I find they can be influenced quickly by other people around them and feel very uncomfortable not having a support group of their of their same age range and that and that was a problem too with some of the groups we had in hospital is that you know you had uh, mostly men in there so women wouldn't feel comfortable but also people of younger age didn't feel comfortable in those group settings as well. So I think um, it's trying to really find resources for them within that age range uh, to, to make people feel comfortable uh, to, to, to stay into treatment um, and also trying to find, uh, you know, they don't often have a lot of family supports as well. Uh, and, and, that, and that presents as a challenge. I'm wondering, just building on that, if you have any comments about um, detoxes, for separate detoxes for men or women, for people who identify as male, female versus or um, combined? As you saw from the Toronto context, um, we do have two co-gendered facilities uh, and I think one gender specific for each. Yes, the answer is yes, definitely. In Toronto, traditionally, the, the women-only site is called Women's Own under UHN, of now Unity Women's. Um, definitely from a woman-identified perspective, um, you can already tell the disparity if so if, if, between access. So the number of beds available for women identified is one fifth, but it's more than that if you uh, factor in the co-gendered. If those beds are filled, then you you don't have access. Um, and on in terms of the gender spectrum for gender transgender gender inclusive environments, uh, we we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do because historically the the gender specific uh, sites are very gender specific. So men identified, women identified, and, and it doesn't ref the co gendered areas are both, but it's still very binary. And so the work with the withdrawal management it has been to focus our efforts in becoming more gender inclusive. Um, but you can imagine, you know, um, you know. <laughs> getting out of the car or walking to, and if, it, if you don't feel that you're gender inclusive or welcoming, that in itself is a barrier. Um, also, it's interesting, um, we don't have a lot of reach to uh, racialized communities or communities of newcomers as a sector itself. And that is also uh, like across the system, as we all know, but that is also very evident in the withdrawal management sector. I was just going to add that I, you know, I think that that's one of the benefits of the, the withdrawal management system in Toronto is that we do really try to work collaboratively together. So if somebody, say, comes into a co gendered environment and they're not comfortable, that we are able to transfer and support a transfer to, um, you know, a, the, the the women's service. So I imagine that being even more of a challenge out if outside of the city where we have options when there is perhaps one uh, detox or withdrawal management setting for uh, a much larger area and, and few options or resources for sure. Where to find a list of publicly funded detoxes in Toronto? Anyone want to answer that about the Toronto system as well as the Connects Ontario and and we can maybe talk about how people use those systems. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, um, Connex um, would, you know, have all the information. Um, you know, I think when, because we have a centralized intake, um, it's harder to find our individual inf yeah. contact information. Um, so whenever, you know, if you put in a search, for uh, withdrawal management in Toronto, um, it, it will come up as the, the centralized intake. Um, but, you know, um, on Connex, you'll be able to find information about each of the sites. Um, and on, I mean, if you don't know the hospitals, but on our hospital websites as well. So Unity Health um, and Michael Garin and um, UHN at 
at the moment, um, but they are about to um, back out of uh, withdrawal management. But I correct me if I'm wrong, because after years of doing this, I still find myself challenged. Um, central access is the central place to go so that as an individual practitioner, if I don't have a team of support staff, I don't have to call around to different sites to find out who has a bed, uh, you know, and when, right? Yeah. Angela, you're looking access. for the specific number, the, the phone number for the central access? It's one 866 366-9513. There you go. Most useful thing of the night. You want to say it again? 1-800. No, one 366 9513 And you can always get that through Connects, right? Which is if wherever you are in the province, Connects Ontario is access to, thanks, Sarah, uh, you know, access to the whole host of um, options, including detoxes, residential treatment, et cetera. Um, I would agree, Elizabeth. I know it's very challenging uh, for many people. Um, and I'm seeing your comment also, Elizabeth, about uh, peer support. Um, I don't know much about the, the peer houses or warm environments in the U.S. I wish we could bring you on to speak about that a little bit, but it does sound like a brilliant idea. Um, maybe, um, Rosie, Linda, Keith, could you speak a little bit to how peers are um, working in the detox setting, where they, where they are and what you can share about that? Is that so, something that you've so experienced? For St. Joe's, um, it's actually fairly new for us um, to have uh, peer support roles. Um, I'm not sure, Keith, um, you know, the peer support role has been um, quite well established at, at St. Michael's um, for a number of years. So currently, you know, our peer support is, is providing support um, in the withdrawal management and um, connecting with... Um, the clients in there um where just before we kind of um at one point we were starting to do groups again before omicron came along and so he was facilitating um groups he's also um he provides support up on our um adult um, inpatient mental health unit and actually co-facilitates groups up there um as well um, and we have actually um, just posted for another position. Um, and, you know, we're hoping to kind of build capacity in terms of the peer support. We, we've had them at uh, peers at uh, St. Mike's probably for four or five years. Uh, peers were instrumental in helping us engage. Um, I'm new to the detox setting, but uh, whenever we had trouble engaging with uh, with people at the bedside, the emergency department and our RAM clinics, we would bring in the peers and they would help with engagement. Uh, harm reduction was a big area for our peer support specialists that could teach people how to use uh, safe injection kits, uh, could teach staff how to use safe injection kits, knew about PIC lines from, from lived experience and teaching about uh, safe injection into PIC lines, risk for overdosing, risks for flushing. Uh, we did a lot of uh, presentations around the hospital together uh, with our team and having peers uh, on board with that. Uh, we've had them working with clients in the ramp clinic, going into the waiting area, giving them a warm introduction, making them feel welcome in the RAM clinics. Uh, we do have one of our peers that sometimes goes over um, to provide support in, uh, in in some of the other detoxes uh, in, in at Unity Health. Uh, but I can say that it's made a huge difference in terms of the way we look at policies, the way we engage patients, uh, the way we work together as a team, and the way we have a kind of a, a broader scope and understanding of, of the need to have all of the uh, stakeholders at the table. I've certainly heard such um, uh, sort of powerful stories about peers engaging um, in the emergency department and helping people to make those transitions through their inpatient stays uh, to detox and treatment and beyond. So I think there's a great role there. Um, and thanks, Elizabeth. It would be wonderful if you would share information about that panel discussion. Um, but something that you, you mentioned, Keith, um, around uh, harm reduction teaching, 
um, made me think about harm reduction in the withdrawal management setting. And I can imagine many scenarios that could come up around people uh, having challenges with withdrawal and abstinence and um, heading out and using uh, many different ways, whether it's um, opioids or alcohol, uh, smoking weed, smoking cigarettes. Um, I'm wondering if in our few minutes, you could talk a little bit about some of the sort of parameters around people being able to continue to stay uh, in the detox setting as they're managing, managing those challenges, what are hard lines and, and what are some of the ways to, to try to manage those risks? I think one of the biggest challenges in in the detoxes is kind of, uh, you know, what I find really challenging in the context of, of detoxes is, is, you know, if, if, if people go out and they use, there's, uh, you, you know, uh, sometimes they'll be let back in, sometimes they'll be discharged. One of the things I really find challenging is when you, uh, you, you know, you have um, evidence-based treatments, opiate replacement therapy, uh, you know, other treatments for alcohol use disorder, and they go off to other treatment programs and they're forced to stay in the detox, uh, not forced to stay, but they're in the detox and they're going through horrible withdrawal, but because they want to get into this program that won't take them if they're on opiate replacement therapy, they, they, they end up, they're, they're set to fail in the beginning and they often, um, you know, relapse as a result of that and they'll have a slip or some, uh, you know, something that, that happens along the, the course of their stay there. I find I'm finding that with a good number of the other uh, residential programs that people often uh, are, are segued into and in that. And I think it's really having an understanding of, of, of what's going on in that and trying to work with the, these uh, residential programs, which is often very challenging to have them understand the context of why somebody needs to be on opiate replacement therapy. And it's not like they're, they're using an illicit substance on the street, giving them the standard of care I find is a challenging uh, thing. And I find different detoxes will have different thresholds in terms of what they'll uh, put up with and that some will give a second chance, some won't give a chance at all. And I think you know, and I know this is a complicated thing, but I, I think we need to take a look at harm reduction, not as static and abstinence is static. I think people use poly substances and some people are going to want abstinence from specific substances, but they're going to want harm reduction, uh, you know, with other things. So for example, maybe somebody's on, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's getting safe supply and uh, maybe they want to abstain from alcohol. Uh, where does that, how does that fit into the context of a detox setting if they do in fact want to de detox from substances, but they want to use harm reduction strategies with other substances? And I, I, I find that a, a kind of a confusing concept in terms of, of looking at, the, uh, at a detox setting. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, and I, I just noticed uh, Nick's question there, you know, about uh, um, safe supply and you know, I think um, what what we try to do is sort of identify uh, risk factors. And, you know, if, if somebody um, uses while in our unit, we, we really, you know, are looking at sort of what's the risk and, you know, how do we support that? On the other hand, we're balancing that with, um, you know, people wanting a safe environment yes. um, to, to be in. And so, you know, how do you balance um, supporting somebody who is, you know, using a substance and somebody who is sort of in a, an abstinence place and yet they're both in the same room and we're trying to kind of balance um, each each of their needs. And so it's sort of really looking at, at, at safety. And I think, um, you know, the safe supply has has presented some challenges for us. And actually, at this moment in time, we have um, four clients in our care who are all on safe supply. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to support them um, and their goals. But um, we also have the rest of the treatment sector or, you know, some of the other community resources that aren't there yet either. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of... Um, like safe supply is is going ahead, and a lot of the community centres, uh, community health centres, um, are are you know supporting it, but the rest of the system hasn't quite got there. 
And so, you know, withdrawal management finds itself kind of in the middle of that um, trying to sort of navigate and negotiate that. I, I know we just have two minutes left, but I'm just wondering if you could explain briefly how you've been integrating um, safe supply, I'm assuming opioid use with someone who's um, actually in detox. Are they going to a pharmacy and taking medications there in the way that someone would if they were on OAT or is there some other model? Yeah. Yeah, for the for the most part, um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I mean, what we're finding is it's methadone um, and, and Cadian for the most part. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's it's prescribed as daily dispense. And so they're going to the pharmacy sometimes twice a day yep. um, to, to get um, their, their dose um, witnessed by the pharmacy and, and then coming back to the unit. Mm -hmm. and, and and in terms of the harm reduction, we've I think we meet people where they're at. And sometimes people, it's not about whatever goal, it's just here and now, I just need a break. And that is the intervention itself. So, uh, you know, a break, or step to abstinence or step to harm reduction and, and safe supply is supported. So people, and the main thing is the safe supply prescriber needs to give us the directions and dispense at the pharmacy and they're supported. Uh, but you can already see as we look ahead to 20 year, 30 year planning, there is a lot of opportunity within community-based withdrawal managements to get connected and kind of expand the horizon. Well, thank you for bringing us back to trying to think think broadly uh, from where we are now and the amazing work that's going on uh, in the sector. So much of it led and championed by NPs to really thinking about building uh, a stronger, more creative, more responsive system and, and looking at the challenges ahead. I know that there's been a lot of work done uh, by AMHO and others on trying to make it really clear that OAT is a component of treatment uh, that, um, you know, we should not be telling people they need to detox from their treatment in order to actually, you know, as you say, meet their goals and where they are. So um, that's a message that I think is really starting to make its way uh, in a, a much more consistent way through the residential treatment system. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's 8.30. How time flies. Um, I want to thank Linda, Keith, and Rosie again for a really engaging presentation. Please plan to join us in March for our webinar with Guy Felicella from Vancouver, who's talking about uh, his, his journey, including both uh, harm reduction and recovery, and places in between, and what we can learn and how we can begin to work together in that journey as as we support people across the spectrum. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us tonight and have a good night, everyone.